Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to The Longest Journey. Very cyberpunkish. Very cyberpunkish. It's a mishmash of old and new computer hardware. Hello? Are you Burn? Yeah, chill out, baby. Chill. Be there in a sec. And way to make it obvious with the cyberpunk call out. How'd you get down here? Who the hell are you? I knocked, you let me in, we spoke only a few minutes ago. Warren's friend April? Warren who? I don't know any war- Oh, Warren's right, yeah, Fire Lizard. Zeke. He's a good supplier, the Flipper likes him. Likes him good. You a buddy of his? Yeah, oh, you his baby, yeah. Oh, sure, I date 15 year olds all the time. Whatever. So, what the fuck do you want? Such a charming person. You're weird. So are you. What is this place? This is the Flipper's Boutique, mademoiselle. I sell everything from joy chips and porn cubes, strictly hardcore. Max, illegality. What would be the fucking point otherwise? The satellites and BH generators? What I don't have here, I can get, for a price. This place ain't your neighborhood S-Smart. Let me tell you, shop smart, shop S-Smart. Nah, what I got here costs moolah, mucho moolah. Are you in the market for a neutronium bomb, by the by? You got a hot one sitting in storage. Give it to you for a cool 100 million, huh? Bargain. Interested? Sure, let me just check my wallet. No, of course not, are you crazy? <laughs> I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> what happened to your legs? Jesus, are you fucking kidding me? My fucking legs, huh? You wanna know? I wouldn't have asked if I didn't wanna know. That's how you took my legs, Captain Crunch. Now, answer this question for me, I'll tell you who took them. Sure. Are you a virgin? What? I ain't telling you nothing until you answer the question there, Trebek. You know, he'd probably just lie even if we were honest. That's none of your business. Then it's none of your business how I lost my little legs. Got it? Got it. Alright, down to business. I need some information. So visit the fucking library, or go bother the Oracle, or whatever. The Flipper can't help you. That's too bad. I guess Warren was wrong about you. Yeah. Hey, what? What was he wrong about? About you being the best there is at getting information. Any kind of information. I guess you can't help me. Fuck yeah, I'm the best. Best there ever was. Better than Chocolat. I'm the king of data streams, the emperor of the feed, baby. What kind of information do you need? I need information on a guy called Jacob McAllen and an organization called the Vanguard, or the Church of Voltec. Sounds pretty heavy. I gotta tell you, Voltecs and shit, they got security top of the fucking food chain. You got something concrete for me to go on here, huh? Besides names, names are nothing. What do you mean? Details! Gods and the Jesus is in the details, woman! There's a fucking ocean of info out there. Gotta know where to start, what to focus on, where do I begin? Give me a map! I think we got one of those. Thanks for your help, Mr. Flipper. I'm the Flipper. The Flipper. Call me Burns, yeah. Beautiful. Ha! See ya! Yeah, we got a data cube. Doesn't work at your, uh, ordinary home computer, but that's not what he's got here. Hey! I'll be right up! I got this data cube from the police station. Yeah, so what the hell is on it? You asked for details? This thing has details. Plenty of it, I hope. 
And you expect me to sort through this shit for you, locate the relevant information, dive into the big blue sea of corporate security and fish out whatever it is you need from the feed? Could you? Please? Shit, you're cute. But if you weren't Warren's little plaything, I'd kick you out. And whatever. Hand it over and I'll give me a few minutes. I'm a bit confused why they made this a two-step process. Could have saved a little time there by uh, just handing it to him through dialogue. What the hell is he even doing down there? Okay, he's done. Holy macaroni, you do know what the fuck you're fucking with here, yeah? You do know, don't you? These guys are the fucking epitome of uncoolness. It's good stuff, though. Precious information. I gotta hand it to you, sexy. You know what you were doing bringing this to the flipster. So, what can you tell me about the Vanguard? Is there anything in there about where they're located and how to get access to their files? Shit! Aren't you a little too eager to trot with the beast, babe? Slow down, chill. I'll tell you what you need to know. But first, take a look at this recording. Just step over to the screen there, and I'll play it back for you, okay? To join in the effort, we must charge forward into a new era of compassion, companionship, and goodwill. An era of expansion and enrichment. A golden era. We must forge a future for ourselves, our children, and our children's children that can withstand the forces that oppose us. We shall be victorious. created to do is bring spirituality back into our lives and into our world. Spirituality and knowledge. Our enemies have suppressed the truth for too long. We can no longer stand idly by while they spread their lies and their disinformation to the people of our planet. We must fight back. We must take to arms and defend ourselves against our oppressors. I am not, by nature, a man of violence, nor are you. I know that. But the time comes when all people must do their duty to protect their ideology and to preserve their beliefs. That time has come. Our time. We will do what we must to protect ourselves and our families. We will do what we must to defend our beliefs against the heretics. We will go to war if that's what it takes. Man, so much for the compassion at the beginning of the speech. Charismatic, but cold. What do you think? Your friend and mine, Mr. Jacob McGallan. Head honcho of the Church of Voltec, or the Vanguard if you wish. Suppose a peaceful philosopher, dude. Not the case, as it turns out. Obvious Hitler complex, real Nazi wannabe. This is heavy, dangerous shit you got here, and I love it. But I thought the Church of Voltec was a peaceful religion dedicated only to meditation and philosophy. You and 20 billion other souls, Missy. This is the truth, as clear as simple as butter. Now take a look at this, on the screen again. Who's this? That's a guy named Gordon Halloway. Evil looking dude, huh? Turns out he's McAllen's right hand man, runs the Vanguard's secret ops. There's a gold mine of info on this data cube. Yeah! The Vanguard have a bunch of agents that they've bred in tanks. 
The grasp of genetic engineering far surpasses anything I've seen so far. I've seen everything. From what I can tell, the Vanguard are up against an enemy they call the Fathers of the Sentinel. I don't know who the fuck they are, but I'll find out. Must be the good guys, though, if they're fighting these creeps. Anyhow, this guy Gordon, he was originally intended for some kind of religious duty, whatever the hell it was, for the Sentinel dudes. Let's say, like, Dalai Lama or whatever. But the Vanguard kidnapped him before he was ready, and they did some shit with him, some experiments to try to use his powers, and I'm thinking this spiritual crap. It's just bullshit. But, both the Vanguard and these Sentinel dudes, they believe this kid has powers, that he's destined for something very important, so when the Vanguard grab him, that's like, holy shit, fucking big deal. What kind of experiments did they perform on the child? Weird fucking thing. He's trying to control these powers he has? They fuck up big time, though. And the kid is totally screwed up. Split in half in some spiritual way. One part chaotic, the other pure logic. So now this dude Gordon, he's like the coldest motherfucker you'll ever meet, so stay out of his way. According to these documents, he'll kill somebody for cutting in line ahead of him, which I'll do too. You know, or like coughing in his own direction, which I'd fucking lop your head off for, but anyway. Now, he runs the whole dark side of the Church of Voltec, and I'm guessing he's next in line to take over. After old man McCallum leaves this earthly realm, which could take ages, I'm afraid, with the tech these guys got. How come the police were able to gather this much information on the Vanguard, and yet they don't do anything about it? I don't know, maybe it's routine. Maybe they want something on the bastards to pressure them when they really need to. And maybe the information just got lost in the system. The fact is, though, that with assholes like these walking among us, we're not safe. None of us. Least of all you. So please don't hang around longer than necessary. Yeah. So, okay, these guys are badasses, and I should stay as far away from them as possible. Disregarding that, however, where are the Vanguard headquarters? Uh, you're either very brave or very stupid, Jaquita. But, whichever it is, I shouldn't tell you. Why? Because I'm a girl and I can't take care of myself? No, because anybody who fucks with these guys is sure to end up with a bullet lodged in the back of their skull. Or worse. I'll take that chance. Shit. You know, I'm the flipper. The flipper. I'm not into this shit, you know. I'm strictly into sales and profit. This detective shit you're doing. What the hell is it? Why are you doing it? That's, uh... Very long story. It's some other time, yeah? I really need that information, Mr. Flipper. Okay, chill, dick smack. I got it. I got it. You see, the church has several unofficial headquarters round and about, but they're insignificant in cover operations, basically. There's no concrete address on this data cube you gave me, but I scanned it through some online records quickly, and I discovered that the Voltex, the Vanguard, are linked to a very big company indeed. Which is... MTI, Malkuth Technologies Incorporated. Big guys. Almost as big as Bokamba Mercer. Fake the hell out of me. But it looks like the head honchos of the Vanguard may be running MTI. Which is kind of funny, because I got some beef with MTI. Some heavy-duty beef. And now I got something to hit them back with, fuckers. What does that mean? That MTI is run by the Vanguard? It means that wherever the corporate headquarters of MTI are, you'll probably find the Vanguard Elite. And do you know where the MTI corporate headquarters are located? I'm the flipper, dude! What the fuck do you think? Shit! Don't answer that. Grendel Avenue. I don't know where that is. You don't know where Grendel Avenue is? Holy Christ! You're kidding, yeah? It's like the numero uno neighborhood in Newport. Oh, the top dogs live there. Apartments go for hundreds of millions of dollars. How do I get there? Sorry, babe. A slag like you are stuck on the ground level for all eternity. There's no stepping up in the world for you. you gotta have proper ID, top level ID, to get to Grendel Avenue. And you don't, babe. Sorry. Well, I imagine he's gotta be able to help with that. Hey, Burns? I'll be right up! What is it? Could you fix me up with some fake identification? 
Why would you want that? How else am I going to get to Grendel Avenue? Hey, I'm warning you, don't fuck with those Vanguard shitheads. Yeah, they bite. And I bet you they don't let go like fucking, what do you call those little fucking dogs that don't let go? Pitbull Terriers? Shit. Man, those things are nasty, fucking wicked nasty. Can we discuss the fake identification I need? Baby, I gotta tell you, it's gonna cost you cash only. You got a lot of cash? Lots of it. You better come it out of your ears, baby. And sorry, friend of a friend and all, but it ain't cheap. And I advise you to forget about it pronto. Let me worry about that. How much will it cost me? I have, like, $300. Ha! Ha ha! Try 20k on for size, shortcake. Sorry, little missy, but fake IDs cost a moolah. I need to buy a properly generated key from a connection downtown. I need an authorized blank card. You're an idiot. It don't come cheap, that stuff. Even if I cut out my profit, which for a friend of Warren's, I just may. <laughs> It'll still come to $15,000, baby. Would you consider alternative forms of payment for a fake ID? Sorry, Chiquita. That urge disappeared with my little legs. No! I'm not that... God forbid! More like a... a favor or something you need. Don't think I need a... Whoa! God! Shit! It gets me every time. What's up with your chair? Ah, the anti-grav control unit is fried like fried taters, brainiac. Ah, it'll be gone, gone, gone for a good in a few days. But I'm hoping my good friend, my buddy, my mate, Freaky Sales, gets me a new one before that, so it don't fall down. If I get you a new anti-grav control unit, would that get me a fake ID? <laughs> if you found a good one that actually works, and one that can lift more than 200 kilos, hey, sure. Like you're gonna find one. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact. Thanks. Sure. Let's just check the diary here. But yeah, I got everything before I came here, and hey, go figure. It came in handy. Hey! I'll be right. Is this what you need? Whoa! Heavy duty! That baby's worth just enough for me to get you top of the line all access ID, babe. Yeah! Hey, with this I might even be able to zoom on out of here once in a while. Excellent! So how soon can you have the ID ready? Ah, uh, a couple of days. A couple of days? I need it now! Oh, no, 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 no. Ain't gonna happen. Shit takes time, you know? Shit takes time. Tomorrow night at the earliest. Can't promise anything, though, but I'll certainly try for the little girl. Oh, he's still going. Hmm. Well, I guess he's getting right to work. It's, uh... The Flipper. You know, there was a time in my life when I thought Burns Flipper was not completely annoying. Sadly, that time is now over. Gas or water? So there's one other thing we gotta do tonight. Staring up support for their ideas, and Arcadians, those easily misled sheep, they embrace these ideas because they prophesize change, and change is always attractive to humans. Not only humans, the Vanguard are using a tyrant to force their changes into effect. They say the tyrant have turned to religion, that they have... Ah, the tyrant. Those beasts are not much for loyalty, but promise the money and power. The Vanguard are probably ready to offer them half of the Northlands, perhaps even Mercuria itself for their services. And they have certainly wanted to put their filthy claws on that city for as long as I can remember. Yes, it's beginning to look quite bleak. What about the girl? 
I think she may have seen the light, finally. She does not know even half of what is going on, and if she did, I do not think she would be able to handle it. Better she does not know. Aren't you worried that the fate of the balance in our worlds is in the hands of a... a child? A simple country girl? Of course. I do my best to help her, as does the mother in her way. Still, April will be on her own soon enough, and then... who knows? After all, she is the one. No one seems to doubt that. The balance knows, and the balance provides. And if the balance believes in this girl, we should as well. Spoken as a man of true faith. But of course, Father. You're not the only one who places his faith in higher powers. Speaking of higher powers, I have to go prepare my sermon for tonight. And what lessons will be taught today? You know the usual. Sacrifice, devotion, faith. The cornerstones of any religion. Even the vanguard seem to follow these tenets. They require devotion through faith just as much as we do. Good night, Raul. Que Dios te bendiga. So I, I guess we're just going to go around the pillar here like we didn't just hear all of that. But she does write about it in her diary. It's Cortez. It's beautiful in here, don't you think? So quiet, so spiritual. See, I'm no Catholic, but I still like coming here to meditate. To pray, if you want. If you're not a Catholic, who do you pray to? To the universe. To the balance, to the rock in this floor, and, and the air around us, to you and, and to myself. What is that, Buddhism? Animism. It's life, senorita, pure and simple. So, what did you dig up today? Oh, nothing, except for everything you ever wanted to know about the Vanguard and Jacob McAllen. You got the information? You found Warren? He helped you? Eventually. It wasn't easy, but I know where to find McAllen, and I'm working on how to get there. I should be all set by tomorrow. Good news. And just in time, too. Things are not going well out there. What do you mean? The balance is collapsing, and magic is seeping through into this world. Stark is still protected by its strong currents of logic and order, but Arcadia is on the brink of war and utter chaos. Unless we act quickly, Arcadia will fall into disorder, and Stark will follow. Can't we get help? Everyone with the power and will to help is doing so. But you are so much more important than anyone else. You can travel to Arcadia to bring order to chaos. At least until we find the Guardian and return him to his realm. What about the Vanguard? We investigate your lead tomorrow, yes? If we find what we are looking for... If they have the Guardian or know where he is, then we are one step closer to victory. But we still need to find the entrance to his realm. And the situation in Arcadia is not getting any better, not without your help. I don't know anything. What can I do? By just being there, you are helping. You are strong in the balance, April. And your power flows into those you meet and helps them against the tides of chaos. Whatever you do, however you do it, you are helping. I still feel so... so helpless. I don't understand half of what you tell me, and as for the other half, I can't help being skeptical. Good. Do not trust everyone or everything, and make a stand against that which you do not believe. Just be sure to accept the truth when you find it, and embrace the good in the world. I'll do my best. What are we going to do now? Tomorrow, we will visit with McAllen, find what he knows and use it. Then the day after, you will go back to Arcadia. At most, we have a week. But it should be enough. As for today, relax. Be with your friends. I don't think I'll ever be able to relax again. We pay a heavy price for our knowledge, yes. But try to enjoy yourself, because the hard work begins in the morning. I will see you then, yes? Wait, wait! 
Where are you going to be this time? We will meet here, yes? I'm afraid I cannot go back to Venice. Not now. There are people looking for me. The Vanguard? Yes. They know what I am, who I am. They will not rest until they have me. So we must work very fast to destroy them. Tomorrow, then? Tomorrow. Have a good night, okay? Be careful. Thank you, Senorita. And you. All right, then. Gonna prepare for a, uh... To learn more. Although he is being kind of optimistic since, uh... Well, since from what we know... We won't be able to reach McAllen. Until, um... Oh, he's not here today. But yeah, we won't be able to reach McAllen. Oh, nobody's here today. Until tomorrow evening, which is when the fake ID will be ready. So, you know, what what the hell else are we going to be doing for the rest of the day? I ask a question. Alright, friends aren't hanging out at the bar. Or the cafe. Nobody's on the couch. And... There's a prick in the hall. Hey, what are you doing? Looks like he was listening in on the door, but uh, April's been out all day. Oh, that explains it. Charlie, Emma, what are you guys doing here? We locked ourselves in to wait for you. I hope you don't mind. No, of course not. By the way, I think Zack was spying on you guys. I caught him leaning up against the door, and he hurried back into his room the second I arrived. He's such a loser. And he seems to have a personal vendetta against you now after what you did to him. Or what he claims you did last night. Gotta love the guy. So what's up? What's the occasion? We want to know what's going on with you, April. What do you mean? Nothing's going on. Don't lie to your best friends. That's way below you. We know something's going on. There's no point denying it. For three days straight, you've been away all day. You've been acting weird and hanging around Cortez, of all people. And then today we find out you've been up to Metro Circle by yourself? I mean, April, for God's sake, what is going on? You know what? Maybe we should just come clean. If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Try us. We're your friends. Whatever it is, I'm sure we can help. Somehow. Yeah, be honest. Bring them in on this. They're already at risk. People know they're your friends. I've been... Uh, chosen to save the world. <laughs> Stop kidding around, April. We're serious. So am I. I told you, you wouldn't believe me. You're actually telling us the truth. What do you mean you've been chosen to save the world? As in, there's something really bad going down. I can't say exactly what, but Cortez is with the good guys, and I've been... drafted. Look, April, if you're having some kind of nervous breakdown, we'll do anything to... God, I knew I should have kept my mouth shut. Forget it. I don't even believe in myself. So why should you? I believe you, April. I've seen things these past few days, strange, inexplicable things. And my grandma taught us that there's more to this world than meets the eye. And after all, it's you saying these things. My friend, April. I've never known you to lie or even exaggerate the truth. If you believe it, I believe it. And I'm sure the same goes for Emma. Thank you, Charlie. It means a lot to me. I wish I could tell you everything, but I don't think I can. I understand. When you're ready. But if there's anything, anything at all we can do to help, well, don't hesitate to ask. Sure. Let's get some help. 
There are a few things you could help me with. Great. What? Like I said, I can't really tell you very much about what's going on. Not yet, anyway. Tomorrow, after I've had a good night's sleep, I'll try explaining as much as possible. But there's one thing you can do for me. I have reason to suspect that somebody's out to get me, or Cortez. Who? Long story, but I could need some backup. These goons, these agents, they could be closing in, and whatever advance warning you're able to give me... We'll do our best. What do they look like? I'm not sure, but you'll know when you see them. I'm sure. Anybody suspicious around, let me know. This is kind of exciting, but you gotta tell me, what are they after you for? Did you do something illegal? Yes. Not yet. Not really. It's what I might do that they're worried about, but please don't ask me any more questions today. Just keep your eyes and ears peeled for anything weird. I need a good night's sleep, and tomorrow I should be able to tell you more. But thanks for helping me out, guys. I really appreciate it. We're all hanging out at the cafe tomorrow night, April, so you're just gonna have to join us. I promise. Now get some sleep. Sorry to tell you this, but you look totally exhausted. I'm glad we had this talk. Thanks for checking up on me, guys. Sure. Good night. Good night, Charlie. Good night, girl. Sweet dreams. Yeah, and fuck the masquerade. You know what I'm saying? Also, apparently, night never comes to Newport. Come on, both your legs. There you go. Just gonna ignore the pillow, though, apparently. Oh dear. This can't be good. What's that noise? Oh dear. That doesn't look good either. Yeah, I think you guys know what that is. Where's that light coming from? So, yeah. So much for staying in Stark. That was definitely a portal April fell into at the end, and so today we're getting another portal episode. This one is rather unique, because it's part of a six book series, and it's a tie-in with a Dungeons and Dragons campaign setting. The novel in question is The Ultimate Helm, written by Russ T. Howard in 1993. The Story About the Story Back in the early 1970s, two guys named Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson started to develop some new rules for the fantasy war games they liked to play. Instead of representing an army, each player would represent one character, and these characters could find magic items and become more powerful as they grew in experience. Also, one of the players would be responsible for creating and presenting the challenges that the player characters would encounter, becoming a referee, or dungeon master, if you will. Gygax and Arneson couldn't find a wargame company that would publish their unique rule set, so they created their own company, Tactical Studies Rules, or TSR. Now, the story of TSR is messy and complicated, but for the purposes of this story, you only need to know that the game and its rules developed over time and eventually got a second full edition in 1989. By this point, D&D had a few published campaign settings, including Greyhawk, Dragonlands, and the Forgotten Realms. However, for the start of the second edition, DSR decided to shake things up by creating a few non-traditional settings that would give players some interesting options. These new settings included Ravenloft, a horror campaign setting published in 1990 and based on the popular Ravenloft adventure modules of 1983 and 1986. Then there was Dark Sun, a post-apocalyptic desert world, more in line with the sword and sandal genre, like Conan the Barbarian. You also had Planescape, 
setting that centers around the outer planes of the D&D cosmology rather than the prime material plane, where all the normal settings take place. But the setting we're looking at today expands that prime material plane in ways that no one had ever seen before. The setting is called Spelljammer, and it came out the same year as second edition. Put simply, Spelljammer is a fantasy space exploration game. As such, it deliberately ignores everything we know about actual outer space and astrophysics, and instead combines a few outdated and nonsensical theories to create a very unique experience. Every solar system is contained within a massive crystal sphere that sits just beyond the outermost orbit, and stars are glowing portals or bright gemstones or what have you that stud the black crystal's surface. The exact details depend on the crystal sphere in question. And that's not all. While the default system is heliocentric with spherical planets, some systems are geocentric, while others have planets shaped like rings or spirals. Gravity in Spelljammer is a constant, so even if you're on a tiny ship or an asteroid, you'll experience 1G. On spherical planets, gravity points down towards the center, but on smaller objects, there's a plane of gravity. And up and down switch places, depending on which side of the plane you're on. Also, ships, and even individuals, carry a pocket of air with them when they leave an atmosphere, and the size of this pocket is based on that object's mass. However, this air only has so much oxygen in it, and so if a voyage lasts too long, everyone on board a spaceship could suffocate. Outside of every crystal sphere is something called the phlogiston, which is named after an outdated chemical theory that developed in the 17th and 18th centuries. When you find the right currents in the phlogiston, or the flow, you can travel at interstellar speeds between crystal spheres. And incidentally, this means that player characters can travel between existing campaign settings. All they need is a spell jamming helm a magic seat that absorbs spell slots, or in some cases hit points, and it then uses that energy to propel the ship through a crystal sphere void and through the rainbow-colored flow. In 1984, TSR started publishing novels based on their campaign settings and, in some cases, on the author's player characters. Dragonlands and Forgotten Realms were by far the most popular book lines, but by 1989, TSR got in the habit of releasing at least a few books for each setting. That's how we get to the Cloakmaster Cycle, a set of six books that explores the Spelljammer setting. The six books were written by five different authors, including game designer David Cook, Shadowrun co-creator Nigel Finley, Dragon Magazine editor Roger E. Moore, and actual professional author Elaine Cunningham. Then there's the author of the last book, Russ T. Howard, which seems to be the pen name of Howard Warnham. Not sure why, since it doesn't seem like he's written much of anything else. Anyway, that's enough background for now. On to... The Story. The Ultimate Helm is the sixth book out of six, so let me quickly summarize the previous five. Teldon Moore is a poor farmer who lives on Kryn, the Dragonlands world. He's a veteran of the big war that kicked off the setting, but he personally saw no action. Then a spelljammer ship crashes in his field, and an alien woman gives him her cloak just before she dies. Teldon discovers that he can't remove the cloak after that, so he and the sole survivor of the crash, a giant hippopotamus man named Herfin Gonja, travel to a Tinker Gnome stronghold since the Tinker Gnomes are a spelljamming race. Once there, they get attacked by Niyogi, slavers and monsters who look like a cross between eels and spiders. Oh, and they're the creatures who caused the original ship to crash in the first place. Eventually, though, Tilden gets away on a gnomish sidewheeler. In the second book, the gnomish ship Tilden's on gets attacked by pirates, and he falls overboard but he gets rescued by a remarkably friendly mind flayer named Estrus. Estrus identifies the cloak as an ancient artifact created by a dead race called the Juna. And after some time in space, they rescue an elven woman named Rihanna, who's on her way to Toro, a Forgotten Realms planet. They land at Evermeet, which turns out to be a major elven spell jamming port, and Telden speaks to an arcane, 
a race of giant blue humanoids who are the exclusive creators of spellgemming helms. But even the arcane can't remove the cloak, and Brianna turns out to be a Niyogi mole. During a climactic battle, Estrus falls overboard, and so the new captain, Elfred, takes Tilden on as a crew member. By the third book, the two major spelljamming races, the Elves and the Scro, which is orcs spelled backwards, have heard about Tilden's cloak, and it turns out that it's an artifact that can, among other things, control a ship like a spelljamming helm, but without sacrificing life energy or spells. It also makes ships faster and more maneuverable. Now this also happens to be right around when the Second Unhuman War begins, so named because humans are basically the only race who don't care about it. Teldin almost loses the cloak when the Scro General beats him half to death, when he gets rescued and the cloak is reattached to him by a friend who also gives him an amulet that will lead him to his ultimate destination. The fourth book kicks off the treasure hunt phase of the story, and the major character for this leg is a radiant dragon who can travel freely through the void. By the fifth book, Teldin has learned that the Juna created his cloak to control THE Spelljammer, and that's with a capital S. THE Spelljammer is a living ship shaped like a manta ray, and it's so big that it carries a decent-sized city on its back. However, when it opened a portal to leave its home sphere, that portal was so big that the Phlogiston stuff leaked in, touched the central star, and caused an explosion so big that it broke the sphere and wiped out all life in the solar system. The book ends with Teldon having reached the broken sphere and the spell gem, but hot on his heels is every spacefaring race that has learned how to track Teldon's cloak. As the ultimate helm begins, Teldon crash lands his ship on one of the wings of the manta ray. Nothing shoots at him, it's just that their speeds are so different that his ship just shatters across the capital S spell jammer's hull. Teldon survives, though, thanks to his cloak, and he's rescued by a group of human warriors just before a band of Niyogi can capture him. Now, because the Spelljammer is big enough to host a city on its back, it has inhabitants that include every major spacefaring race. A lot of people have managed to reach the Spelljammer over the years, but it stayed a secret this whole time because those who climb aboard are under a secret compulsion to stay on board. Now they can, however, fight each other, and nothing is stopping them from trying to kill Teldon to get the cloak. Teldon and his hosts arrange an alliance between some of the races on board, and he reunites with Quelanus, an elven woman who only appeared in the first book. Quelanus quickly betrays Teldon, something that happens basically once per book, but it's okay in this case because the reason Quelanus betrays him, and the reason that she's on the Spelljammer at all, is because the Niyogi captured her and used their enslavement magic on her. Luckily that's reversible, but Teldon will have to raid the Niyogi camp if he wants his also-mandated love interest for the book. As Teldon gathers allies and his enemies start teaming up, some more familiar faces start appearing, including Estris, the Mind Flayer, and a half-Kender who helped him in the third book. Eventually, the Niyogi team up with the Lich who lives in the tunnels under the city, uh, tunnels that basically work like a circulatory system for the living ship. Teldon goes hunting for them, but above him, the city plunges into an all-out war. Or, at least it does, until the armadas tracking Tilden's cloak reach the Spelljammer. That's when the second part of that secret compulsion kicks in. While the inhabitants of the Spelljammer can normally take their own sides, when the ship itself is attacked, they are forced to man its defenses. An immense free-for-all commences, and meanwhile, Teldon doesn't destroy the Lich or rescue Quilanus, but he does make it to the control chamber where he can take command of the Spelljammer. It's at this moment that his elven companion decides to betray him, because sometimes that happens more than once per book, but it is far too late for such a stabbing to do any good. Teldon becomes one with the Spelljammer, and he learns its tragic story. Not only did it accidentally destroy the sphere it came from millennia ago, but this incarnation isn't even the original. The Spelljammer goes through life cycles, with each one creating a new Spelljammer just before dying. But even so, the newborn has all the memories of the old ones that came before it. Teldon's role is to oversee the next rebirth. 
but he has an idea that may change things this time. First, though, Telden uses his new powers to destroy the Lich for good and make Quilanus the captain of the next generation, a tiny manta ray ship called a Small Jammer. Telden destroys some of the attacking ships with the Spelljammer's giant death ray, but then he sends it into the Broken Sphere, taking some of the flammable Phlogiston along in his wake. Telden then ignites the Spelljammer, and as it lights up the Phlogiston and the Phlogiston burns up all of the attacking fleets, the Broken Sphere uses the energy to heal the Shattering and ignite a new sun at its center. Oh, and this also somehow sends Telden and the Spelljammer into our universe. The end. The analysis. Let me just admit this right off the bat. The Cloakmaster Cycle in general, and the Ultimate Helm in particular, are not great books. They're decent enough if you're just speeding through them without trying to analyze everything, but even then, you'll probably get tired of each author using betrayal like they were the first person to think of it. Now, I'll tell you why I really decided to review this book. The setting. Spelljammer is so unique and creative that I love it! They wanted high seas adventures in space without compromising their fantasy settings with science fiction, and so that's exactly what they did. Realism, cohesive physics, open space, why have that when you could do something completely different and unexpected instead? Why not have every star encased in this crystal sphere? Why not introduce races like hippo people obsessed with gunpowder? and turn the existing races into empires, like the British Elves and the Prussian Scrow. And since these ships don't have to conform to the laws of physics, why not have elven ships shaped like giant butterflies, illithid ships shaped like nautiloids, and liches who fly around in goddamn step pyramids? Now, I do understand why the setting never really took off, at least not outside of a few die-hard fans. People who want to play a fantasy game want to play a fantasy game, not some weird sci-fi hybrid like Spelljammer. Well, and even if they did, Spelljammer introduces a lot of complicated rules, and if you want to have a proper campaign of it, you have to at least get a vague understanding of them. Even if you love the idea of this setting, 2nd edition D&D was cumbersome enough, even before you add three-dimensional ship-to-ship combat. Still, today's D&D game designers certainly haven't forgotten about Spelljammer. The Neogi are a monster in the 5th edition core books, and the GIF showed up in a recent expansion, firearms and all. Hell, there may even be Spelljamming ships in a future book. So there's still plenty of love out there for the setting, even if it's not popular enough to get its own book again. But more importantly for this analysis is the fact that Spelljammer follows that theme I've brought up before. It takes something old and completely twists it around to make something new. The Crystal Spheres and the Phlogiston are based on old, outdated cosmology theories, and Spelljammer says, well, wouldn't it be interesting to fly around through that instead of through space as we understand it today? Spelljammer also introduces elements of swashbuckling adventure, and in the process it gives the normally good elves the sinister undertone of a colonial empire that assumes that its people are inherently superior to all others. It gives the orcs an intelligence and organization that they don't normally have, making them a serious threat to the elves. It then proceeds to throw in every even vaguely intelligent monster race, putting a new spin on each of them, and then it throws in everything else the designers could think of, because why wouldn't they? We have the entire universe at our disposal and every major campaign setting. It'd be a crime to waste them. But the setting was too crazy for some, and too rule-heavy for others, and so the six Cloakmaster books were the only tie-in novels the setting ever got. Thanks for joining me again for today's book review, and I hope I'll see you next time for a story about a civil war and the AK-47.